And here's, uh, looks like John and I uh, discussing some IMAX stuff. You can see the IMAX camera mounted in the overhead. John's going to set up a command post here on the off flight deck. I'll let you tell him tell you about it. Okay, we'll be listening. Okay. Yeah, that's the uh, flight deck, and you're back over to um, looks like Bob Springer right now. He was going to take uh, Aeroflax, and you see uh, Jim there. Jim was working with the Hasselblad out the overhead. Our plan on this path is to jump with the uh, Hasselblad, Bob with the Airflax. I was going to run the IMAX, and uh, you saw Jim and Mike earlier. This is a real nice path down through uh, Central America and across South America. So we had a lot of good uh, photography and a lot of good volcanoes to try to pick up. What you see right there is Bob uh, filming with the 35, taking a couple of John, just out of curiosity, uh, wondering how you're finding the tracking and following a landmark objects with the IMAX handheld without the window mount versus in the window mount. Okay, well, in the window mount, it's, um, it, it works pretty well. The difficulty is acquiring the target uh, when they're the small, specific targets like we're trying to uh, target. Jim has been uh, going out of the forward window, so I'll hand it to him and let him comment about that. Okay, uh, Kathy, about the only real problem with uh, using the handheld the IMAX is making sure that it uh, gets stable and you don't put any forces into it and jiggle it while you're taking the photos. Once you get it in position in uh, either W1 or uh, 6, uh, you're, it really works pretty well. Um, it's a little bit of a, you got to be a little careful getting it up there so that uh, you make sure you get it in right. Uh, what you're seeing now is John and I changing out some film. Uh, John is just taking a magazine off the IMAX camera. He's doing a cleaning process. Uh, I'm against the far uh, starboard bulkhead downloading the magazine and then uploading another magazine of uh, outdoor film. You can see that uh, as long as everything is velcroed in place and you have foot loops to uh, use, it works pretty well. You really do need a lot of stability to use that uh, bag in order to change out the film. Yeah, I remember that can get, uh, get to be pretty ornery if you're not well stabilized. Uh, it's worked out pretty well. Pretty steep learning curve from the first one you do until after you've done it two or three times. I think probably the, the rest of this uh, VTR tape uh, just goes through showing us uh, changing out the film and then uploading uh, the IMAX. And I believe at the end uh, there's a little bit of uh, chicken egg experiment as well.
Okay, Jim, I think we've got about uh, a good 10 minutes more KU coverage uh, this pass, so whatever you'd like to keep sending to us, we're sure enjoying seeing life aboard the orbiter again. Okay, well, we'll let it continue to roll and uh, narrate it as uh, things occur. Right now, I'm going to hand it back to Jim because he's getting ready. He's uh, winding up a can that he has actually just taken out of the black bag. Here, Jim. Okay, one of the things that we have to do to make sure that that exposed film doesn't see any light is, is to make sure it's sealed and back in its uh, transport canister. So that's what I'm doing there. Taping it back up and then putting it in a uh, exposed IMAX bag. We've got about six or seven rolls in there now. After that's done, I put a new uh, can of film inside the uh, change-out bag and then check the magazine over real well to make sure that there's no debris in it. Stick it all back inside and, and do kind of the reverse process by uploading the film. Uh, that whole evolution is... Uh, from the first one to uh, now, it only takes about, oh, I'd say about 15 minutes to, to do it. Earlier, it took uh, considerably more time. Okay, Jim, uh, to interrupt for a second, I have a request for you. We've tried to resend that satellite image for your next South America pass, and if someone could go down and take that guy and whatever other pages may be in the paper tray out, we'll get back into TAG's DTO operations. Okay. Okay, Kathy, we got that uh, satellite uh, photo. It looks real, real good. Okay, I copy. Okay, and Kathy here, Jim is going and getting a, a, a new uh, can of film to load, and I'm taking the old one and marking what it was and, and putting it in our return to Houston. IMAX bag for all the IMAX folks. And of course, using the airlock as a nice storage place. Here's a scene of Jim taking off the tape on the new roll that he's about to go put in the black bag and load in the magazine. And as you can see, uh, Houston and Kathy, uh, you know, one roll of film ends up being three minutes of run time, and that turns into three or four scenes for us, uh, but it takes quite a bit of time to, uh, to set up for each one of those. You bet. About a, probably a factor of ten more time working on it than time running the film. Absolutely. There's Jim working away in the black bag, trying to get that uh, get it set up to load that magazine. Okay, and here, uh, I think Jim is about ready to have the magazine completely loaded. He'll be passing it over to me in a second. Right now, I'm going through the cleaning of the camera. It's important to clean out all the chips. That film is going through there at high speed. And uh, if you 
don't do that, of course, it'll clog up and jam. So we like to take a lot of time to do it right so we don't cause ourselves many more hours of work if it jams. Roger that. And, um, Kathy, if you'd like to now, you can switch to the uh, flight deck camera here. We'll switch it to you, and uh, Jim will give you a little tour through the cabin. Okay, well, why don't you take the cameras as you'd like? We'd appreciate the tour. Okay, well, you see us live on the flight deck now. And Jim will tour you around. As he is, if you have a minute, I'll feed you the chicken eggs log table outside that door. John, we're ready to copy the uh, chicken eggs readout. Okay, uh, MAT, two days, four hours, 28 minutes. Tap one, 99.6, 98.8. 100.9, slant 102. Humidity one, 66, slant 47. Humidity two, 68. 
straight slant 53.5. Hatch up two slant 04, colon 30. Hatch close two slant 04, colon 35. And uh, I'll hand the mic to uh, Mike now and he'll throw you around the cockpit. Okay, we copy all, John. And down the mid-deck, we've got uh, Jim and Bob are loading 35-millimeter film. If it looks upside down, that's because it generally upside down does, too. Just like Jim it may be having entirely too much fun. Yeah, he's had a rough couple of days up here. It seems like there's never enough hours in the day to keep uh, these guys happy. Either that or not enough days in the mission. Yeah, we were wondering how to bring that subject up. Trust me, we've been trying for you. We don't recognize that odd emblem that you just took the camera by. Yeah, I don't either. Discovery, uh, now you've had a tour of our cockpit. You can see it's a little bit crowded up here.
This is Mission Control. Our uh, next TV event is at 2.35 p.m. Central Standard Time. It is an Earth observations briefing originating from the Johnson Space Center, PAO briefing room in Building 2. The briefing is given by Dr. Chuck Wood, who is manager of the Space Shuttle Earth Observations Office at JSC. This is Mission Control. Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to a briefing on the Earth Observations Photography Plan for Shuttle Mission STS-29. Uh, we have with us, uh, to my immediate right, Dr. Charles Wood, manager of the Space Shuttle Earth Observations Office located here at JSC. And uh, to his right, Dr. Kamlesh Lula, uh, lead scientist for Earth Observations Photography Plan for STS-29 and also a member of... Uh, the staff of the Earth Observations Office. I believe Dr. Wood will begin with a few general comments about the Earth Observations Office and its function, and then Dr. Lula will follow with some specifics on the photography plan for STS-29. Dr. Wood? Today, this afternoon here at Johnson Space Center, there is a meeting about the 20th anniversary of the landing of Apollo on the moon. And so we've come to 20 years of space exploration of the moon and other planets. But, and here I want to talk today, Cam and I want to talk today, about something we've been doing even longer. Astronauts have been photographing the Earth since the very first flights of the Mercury program. So it's actually about 26 or 27 years of Earth photography by astronauts using handheld cameras. And this has sort of become a, a program that's not well known now, but in fact it's a national treasure. There are more than 30,000 photographs that the space shuttle astronauts have taken of the Earth. And we would like to review a little bit about the way these astronauts take the photographs, what the photographs show, 
and then in particular, what we hope the crew and the STS-29 mission will be able to bring back and show us. And one of the reasons we do it has recently uh, been made obvious to me by a document that came across at my desk. The a committee, a presidential committee to, re, to be associated with the budget that's submitted to Congress this year, has in it a statement on Earth observations, our changing planet, and it says the scientific objectives of the program are to monitor, understand, and ultimately predict global change. So one of the things that the astronaut photographs help to do is to contribute to programs like this by monitoring, by looking, using the intelligence that they have natively to look down below and see what's going on and, and, and acquire data for it. Let's start with the slides now, if we may. The first slide shows uh, the Earth as only an astronaut can see it. All other spacecraft that photograph the Earth look straight down, and so the space shuttle astronauts have the capability of holding a camera in their hand, looking out the window, and photographing straight down, photographing obliquely so they can see beautiful panoramas like this across the Himalaya Mountains. And so the Space Shuttle Earth Observations Project that Dr. Lula and I represent are in, are in charge with helping train the astronauts to learn what is important on the Earth to photograph and some techniques on how to photograph these objects and then to disseminate the information. All of these 30,000 photographs are available to the public at the cost of reproduction. They are not proprietary data. Next slide. This picture shows uh, who we work for. The astronauts are the, are the people who take these pictures. We are two of the scientists who use them and who train the astronauts. But it's all the astronauts on all the previous shuttle missions, the five fellows who are up there today, and the ones people who are going to fly in the future who take the pictures. And we don't want anyone to lose sight of this. It's the astronauts with their intelligence and their quick reactions that allow us to have these fantastic photographs we're going to show you. Next. This is our platform. It's uh, the shuttle you've all seen many times, so I want you to especially look at the windows. The overhead windows that you see in this view looking straight down in the spacecraft are large windows about 24 inches across. So those are much larger than any of the previous spacecraft, and there's plenty of room for an astronaut to move and look aside. There are two windows side by side. One astronaut can act as a spotter and point out things that are coming while the other takes pictures. There are also the forward windows. Uh, that the pilot and the commander have to look out. Those windows are sometimes used, and there are two windows that look out over the payload bay. So the astronauts are flying not in a very tightly con closed container, as they did in the Gemini program, for example, but they're, they're flying in a place that's almost like a living room with many windows that provides views of the Earth. Next. This is Brewster Shaw, who flew on STS-9 and, uh, and other missions. Brewster is holding the the Hasselblad camera has been used by all American photography from space since Gemini days. The Hasselblads were used to take pictures on the surface of the moon and they're used here to take pictures down towards the surface of the Earth. One of the nice things about a camera is you can change lenses and it changes your perspective of the surface of the planet. You can see broad areas and, and general views or you can change them, put on a telephoto lens and see details of, of areas where you have specific interests. Next. This is the sort of view that most people get of, from space of the Earth. This is a weather satellite image of a hurricane that occurred over, over Madagascar. That's the dotted outline of an island in the bottom of the picture. And on the weather satellite images that appear on TV at night, you only see things with very low resolution, typically four or five kilometers, a couple of miles is the smallest things you can see. And sometimes it's only 10 or 12 miles. The next slide shows what the astronauts were able to photograph during the same, over the same hurricane. So here's an oblique view looking across the hurricane towards the horizon of the Earth. You can see a great deal, deal of detail in the, in the hurricane structure of moving clouds. The next view shows an even more spectacular view. They flew straight over the eye of the hurricane. They photographed straight down. They took pictures as the spacecraft traveled along. So there's stereo views. You can look down 50,000 feet of relief down the eye of this hurricane and see all sorts of fine scale structures relating to the rotation of the, of, the, of the water vapor there to understand better the physics of how hurricanes work. So this is a perspective that only an astronaut who is there who can take advantage of a, of a very dynamic situation of changing weather patterns to record this and document it for scientists to study and for others just to admire for its beauty. Next. I want to stress that what the astronauts do best is take pictures of things that nobody can tell them about. Nobody can say ahead of time 
that that hurricane is going to be there on a particular flight. And nobody can say in this particular case, looking down at the Mediterranean Sea, that there are going to be these very large circular eddy patterns representing ex uh, exchange of energy and, and re reorganization of energy patterns in the Earth's oceans. Astronauts discover these sorts of phenomena and they see them repeatedly. So every shuttle mission, the crews are, are documenting what is happening, what's, what's, what's the nature of, of energy redistribution in the ocean through eddies and shear waves of various types. By the way, for these, for these pictures, and at the altitude the astronauts normally fly, typically you're seeing an area about 35 to 40 miles across. They can change lenses and see a much broader area, but typically it's a broad perspective, much bigger than you get from an airplane. And the smallest detail that can be seen is on the order of about 100 feet across. Next. Well, here's another very dynamic phenomena that an astronaut hap happened to capture. You can see the wake, the white wake of a ship that was sailing by. And as it sailed by the ocean that it was traveling in, again in the Mediterranean, obviously had a shear where water on one side was moving faster than water on the other side. So it's like a fault almost like the San Andreas Fault. There was a zone on the ocean surface where water was moving at different speeds, and the, and the ship's wake acted as a tracer so that we could discover this. Next. Another type of transient phenomena that the astronauts often see are plankton blooms in the ocean. It turns out that plankton blooms are, are places where there's a lot of uh, microscopic plant life and animal life that many fish live on. The Soviets used their astronauts to look for things like this and, and ask their fishing fleets to go there and fish, because that's a place probably where there's a good opportunity to, uh, to increase the, the catch. So astronauts can document things like this. Next. This is a wonderful picture looking over northern Egypt, where you can see the Nile with the vegetation along it leads down to the delta. In fact, the word delta comes from the Egyptian delta, which opens up like a V. And over the over the uh, delta and out across the Mediterranean at the top of the picture, there's a hazy cloud. That, that cloud is made up of dust. It's Sahara sand and dust that's been blown out over Egypt and across the sea. When we looked at the meteorological satellite photograph at the time this picture was taken, we couldn't see the dust because it was a fairly small, faint deposit. But by using the astronaut's perspective of looking diagonally through it, uh, the effective thickness of it increased greatly, and so it was easy to document it. So one of the things we've asked the astronauts to do during the history of the space shuttle program is to be on the lookout for dust storms in the Sahara, because that tells us something about what the climate is. Next. This is a picture that you may have a hard time reading, interpreting at first. But in that photograph, almost everything you see is a cloud of smoke. This is a picture from the Amazon basin that was taken on an earlier mission. And there were many, many different fires that were being used to clear away farmland that they've already harvested the crop from, to perhaps to remove uh, forests so that new crops could be planted there. And it presents a tremendous dust pall, which you'll see in other pictures uh, occupy a huge portion sometimes of South America. So the astronauts are able to document features like this, which obviously change from day to day. Next. This picture shows the boundary between two different countries. On, on the right-hand side is Brazil, and the left-hand side is Paraguay, with the river as the national boundary. And you can immediately see difference in the land use patterns. On one side, the green side, there's, there's much more of the natural vegetation left. Probably there aren't uh, many people in that area using the land for farming. On the right-hand side of the river, much of the natural vegetation has been removed, and, and it's been converted to farmland. So it's fairly straightforward from the astronaut's perspective, to see what's happening on the Earth, both dynamic, short-term, instantaneous things, and more slow-spreading slow phenomena that occur through human activity or through the work of, of nature. Next. And sometimes the photographs are just spectacular. I mean, this picture cries out for somebody to write a book on Florida and put the title of the book across the top of the picture. So the pictures have many sort of emotional uh, impacts associated with them, too. They're excellent in teaching. They're excellent in education. They provide a broad regional context that you can't normally get from other types of images of space. Next. I want to review a couple of things that we learned from the STS-26 photography from the Challenger mission that flew in September. Uh, 
not the Challenger, the Discover mission that flew in September. The last, the last time we had had an opportunity to see the Earth with the astronauts' perspective was in early January of 86, when we had mission 61C. So it's been about two, two and a half years uh, before we got this picture. And, and one of the things we noticed was that we could, the astronauts could take photographs of things that were visible a great distance away. This picture is, is uh, not especially good in general when you look at it. It's a picture of the island of Crete. You can see the volcano uh, Mount Etna there, which actually has a small plume of, of smoke coming up. There's a mild eruption going on. But the remarkable thing is that when the astronauts took this photograph, they were 1,200 kilometers away from Crete. They were looking 1,200 kilometers, I guess that's about 600 miles, through the Earth's atmosphere obliquely. And the atmosphere was clear enough that they could obviously see Crete. They could obviously photograph volcanoes. You can also, if you look closely in that, see the mainland of Italy and the mountains rising up beyond that. So that great penetration of the atmosphere by photography is something that we had not expected. It certainly is not the way the Earth's atmosphere was in the northern hemisphere in the previous shuttle flights from 1981 through early 1986. So we believe that there's been an uh, unanticipated clearing of the Earth's atmosphere based on these photographs um, that were taken in September. And so we're looking for other types of information that can help confirm or refute this. If, if this turns out to be a, a, a valid observation instead of a, a freak occurrence of nice, sharp, clear weather over various parts of the Earth, that we have pictures that see far to the north uh, over Asia, over North America, over, over Europe, it might be because there have been no volcanic eruptions that have placed a large amount of volcanic gases and dust in the atmosphere since 1982. And we believe that the, that the big drought that has been very strong in Africa for a couple of decades may have lessened during last summer. There was the largest rain of the century, rain of the century in, um, in Khartoum. And now our res this view from the uh, interior okay, uh, of Discovery. Uh, for the IMAX folks, uh, we got the crater pretty good. It was a good pass. Okay, John, thanks. We'll pass that to him. Okay, it looks real nice from here. What it look like? for about a minute and a half, so we've actually missed the path. And Discovery, we got good TV now on the uh, flight deck. It gets a little crowded up here with all five of us, but it's the best way to take pictures. Looks real cozy.
Discovery Houston. We're looking through one of the payload bay cameras and looks like we're seeing some lightning on the ground. Yeah, we're sitting here looking at it too. It's really spectacular. This is Mission Control Houston. This is what a lightning storm looks like from an altitude of 169.5 nautical miles as Discovery is now passing over the uh, east coast of Australia, well north of Sydney. Yesterday about this time as Discovery was uh, crossing the island continent, the crew noted uh, thunderstorms uh, over the area of Brisbane and uh, on the next rev attempted to uh, downlink some of those same views to us here on the ground uh, and that attempt was not nearly so spectacular as this one. This is Mission Control Houston, two days, 19 hours, 58 minutes, mission elapsed time, discovery over the Atlantic Ocean, about halfway between Florida and Bermuda. We uh, have just concluded a replay of some video we took earlier on this uh, pass around the world, some video that, took, that came to us uh, from over Australia. We're going to follow that up at 5 a.m. Central Standard Time in about four minutes with a replay of this morning's wake-up music, uh, both that which came down from the Discovery and that which followed going back up from Mission Control. We apologize for some internal technical difficulties 
while that event was taking place. Uh, we were not able to get it out on uh, NASA Select real time, and we're trying to make up for that error now by uh, running a replay, both of the audio and video, which uh, fell out of the sky at that point. This is Mission Control, Houston. appreciate that. Best Control Houston, that interchange between uh, Capcom Pierre Thewitt and Commander Mike Coates has to do with the traditional desire of propulsion systems officers to protect all the uh, gas they can in the front and back ends of the orbiter and the equally strong desire of commanders to uh, roll, pitch, and yaw their vehicles and fly. And there's been a lot of uh, usage of prop to uh, support the IMAX uh, tracking and landmark uh, maneuvers that we've been doing on this mission, which is uh, something that was uh, pre-planned and expected. Coach said he'd be glad to, to uh, give the prop officer free tickets to the movie that will uh, premiere about a year from now based on the footage that they're shooting on this flight. Meanwhile, we're standing by to begin a replay of uh, this morning's wake-up music. And that should come momentarily.
That's fine for them, but can somebody help me find my ship? It's lost, and I've got to beam out of here. Keep up the good work, Houston. Kirk out. Reflections uh, in the window here, but you can see what it looks like basically. Tell Ecom uh, I want my beer. It only took about two, two and a half minutes to come up to 100 degrees, and it didn't even get up to 250 at all times. So. Yeah, he uh, he noticed that right away. I was afraid of that. It's reassuring to have an Ecom that knows what he's doing. Well, he says you're even now since you were good enough to send the TV down.
don't know anybody you didn't get a lot of down like now. But we're all in awe. This has been spectacular. Well, it's good to hear the Amos people are getting some good results here. Yeah, they've been real pleased. Okay, we got them now. This is Miss Control is coming to us live from the mid deck of Discovery. Bob Springer and Jim Bajan in the picture. Springer's parents and wife Molly are in the uh, viewing room overlooking the control center, and uh, Bajan's wife Tandy also in the viewing room overlooking the control center. Okay, Jim, they'll get
Discovery Houston for Mike. Go ahead. Okay, we're going to try again, giving you the pad for the share D prime maneuver when you're ready. Okay, stand by just a second. Here. Okay, we'd like you to use the on-orbit RCS burn procedure in the Orbit Ops Checklist, page 10-9. On page 10-10, your items 5, 6, and 7 will be 022, 060, and 326. And I'll read you the rest of the pad. It will be RCS minus X, TV roll is 180. Trim load is NA, weight is 2,04,565, TIG is 03-02, slash colon, 15, colon, 00, decimal 2, egg 7 targets, all balls, minus 0, 0, 005, decimal 3, all balls, delta V total, 005 decimal 3. Tigo is colon 18. The V goes negative 005 decimal 02. All balls plus 001 decimal 59. HA 178. HP plus 163. That's the rest of the pad on page 10 10, and we'd like you to make a note at the bottom for the minus X burn. Okay, let me read all that back now. Uh, the maneuver item we're going to load will be 022, 060, and 326. It'll be an RCS minus X burn with a TV roll of 180. Trims are NA, weight is 204-565, TIG is 03, slant 02, colon 15, colon 00, decimal 2. Uh, it's all balls, negative 005, decimal 3, all balls. Delta to be total is 005, decimal 3. TIGO is colon 18. Negative 005, decimal 02, all balls, plus 001, decimal 59, HA 178 by 163. Okay, that's a good readback, and an additional note, you'll deflect the THC for 18 seconds and then release. Uh, roger that, 18 seconds. And an additional note, Mike, uh, we're not worried about nulling the Vigos. We're just looking for the time. Okay, understand. And do you have any special time you want to start maneuvering uh, to that attitude? you want to go now? Stand by, Mike. And Mike, you're go to maneuver. Okay, we're on our way.
This is Mission Control at 2.20 p.m. Uh, will be our, our uh, delayed uh, replay of the uh, presidential phone call from Orbit 47 earlier on Flight Day 4 today. And following that replay, we'll do a replay of our Earth views of television that we just got downlinked from uh, Discovery on Orbit 52. This is Mission Control. We just called to congratulate you and your crew on the Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, sitting next to me is uh, our Vice President, who's now head of the Space Council, and who incidentally will be down in Houston in just about two weeks. But what I really want to do is congratulate you, and then hear about how things are going. We're certainly proud of, proud of the mission.
uh, exploration can make to the world's environment. So we're very grateful on that. A couple of more questions about that. I was interested because of the history of this about the student experiments and how that was going. The uh, student experiments are going very well. Uh, both of them were uh, very well thought out and planned for, and uh, they've been going just as we expected. Uh, both John Blaha and myself are looking in on those two experiments, and uh, the data is looking uh, very good, and I think the students will have a lot, a lot of good information to get out when we get back. Well, it's an inspiration to the Americans, I'll tell you, to all of us. The, today's pioneers, and we're seeing you right now, pointing the way for the young, young Americans to... Uh, build our nation's future. Listen, all of you down there at NASA, I heard what Mike said, and let me just, while we're on the air to space, let me simply say to everyone at NASA that you have our strong support. I know I speak for the Vice President. Uh, the space program, especially uh, space station freedom, is an investment in our future. Uh, we're living in tough budgetary times, but I am determined to go forward with a strong, active space program, and I want to congratulate you, Commander Coates, and all of them uh, for this wonderful, wonderful mission. Uh, we look forward to your safe return, and I think it's wonderful that two Marines uh, can get along with a guy from the Navy and the Air Force and a civilian. That shows a, shows a broad-minded approach to life in space. Did you read that? Yes, sir, we did. Obviously, the Marines can get along with the other services, but just in case we have the bot number, there's two of us on board. <laughs> I got the message. Sorry to start it going up there, but listen, congratulations. Congratulations to you, and best wishes, and you've been an inspiration to all of us. So long, and God bless. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and give our regards to Mrs. Bush. Uh, tell her where to find something for the new First Lady. Oh, God, she'll be thrilled. Well, you better come up here and give it to her personally. That would be nice, sir. You're in. You're invited right as of now. So when you get back, why head this way. Over and out. Yes, sir. Have a good day. All at NASA, many, many thanks. Keep up the great work. This is Mission Control. Uh, at 2.30 p.m. Central Time, we will begin a replay of the Earth views over the Pacific Ocean on the uh, first part of Orbit 52. Once again, that uh, TV replay begins at 2.30 p.m. Central Time. This is Mission Control. Discovery Houston.
This is Mission Control. These are our live Earth views, downlink from the payload bay TV of uh, Discovery as it passes uh, over the Pacific Ocean north and west of Hawaii.
Stand by, we'll try it again. Go ahead, Dan. Discovery, this is NBC Houston. Dan Molina speaking. I'm speaking from the microphone that will be used for the interview. How's my voice quality? Okay, Dan, we've got you loud and clear now. You're it's, uh, just like the cat. Loud and readable. Please stand by for a voice check from NBC New York. Roger, standing by. Pot up, pot up, New York. That's going to be just program color. Yeah, that's just going to be program. New York, they. NBC New York, this is Discovery. Uh, we heard a transmission. It was unreadable. Hearing NBC New York. Delayed by the photo print lab New York down. by the Christmas holiday. Discovery, this is NBC. The Today Show is on the air right now. We are going to feed you a live transmission of the program in progress. Stand by for that, please. Roger, standing by. Aboard the shuttle Discovery. As they continued their two million mile journey this morning, they sent back pictures of the Sinai Peninsula. There'll be some more scientific experiments before tomorrow morning's scheduled landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And later here on today, the shuttle astronauts will be interviewed live from outer space. Discovery, this is NBC. Do you copy that transmission? Ed Rabel now reports from El Salvador. Ed, good morning. Good morning, Bob. It is quiet here this morning. In Discovery, this is NBC. Did you copy that transmission? Discovery, Houston, did you read the transmission from New York? Marsha, we're hearing uh, something from New York. Uh, it's kind of uh, an echo, and it uh, sounds like a couple of people talking at once there. It's kind of hard to understand. We heard Dan Molina fine in Houston. Did you hear the uh, live broadcast from New York? Yeah, we heard uh, parts of that. Okay, they weren't talking to you. They were just trying to get you to hear their transmission. Okay. Discovery, this is NBC. Once again, you were hearing a live transmission of the Today Show in progress. When we actually do the interview switch to New York, you will hear Bryant Gumbel speaking to you directly. He cannot do that now because you're on the air. Okay, Discovery, copy. Discovery Houston, we consider that a good voice check, and we'll terminate the voice checks now. Okay, Marsha, and how's the picture you're getting? It's a beautiful picture. And you guys look good, too. Had a girl. Discovery Houston, how do you read? Okay, that's very good. Thank you. Okay, and we're complete with the TV now, and we'll see you back at 2145. Okay, thank you much.
Now that's a picture. We're standing by for the pictures. Okay, we have a good picture from you now. This is Mission Control Houston. We now have a downlink from the mid-deck of Discovery, the crew of Discovery standing by to begin our crew conference activities for this morning. Discovery Houston, we have a good picture from you now. Are you ready for the NBC interview? Discovery's ready. NBC, this is Houston. Please go ahead with your voice call. Discovery, this is NBC Houston. We are not quite ready to proceed with the interview. We would like you to stand by for one moment, please. Discovery, standing by. Can you tell me how long? We'll be ready for this in about 20 or 25 seconds. We are concluding another segment of the program. Discovery, this is NBC in Houston. We are not quite ready to come to you yet. Is my voice quality all right? You sound real good, Houston. Thank you very much. We're standing by for just one second.
pilot John Blaha and mission specialist James Bashian, Robert Springer, and James Buckley. And to help us establish communication, we have NBC News correspondent Dan Molina standing by. He's at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Bryant. Discovery, this is NBC in Houston. Do you read me all right? Discovery, reach loud clear. Well, good morning to all of you, gentlemen, and we thank you very much for agreeing to be with us this morning. First of all, Commander Coates, we all watched with some concern earlier this week as you powered down because of the hydrogen cryo problem. What did you have to do to conserve power during that period, and how did it affect your work? Well, it really wasn't a great uh, deal to us. We powered down a lot of our uh, computer displays, cathode ray tube displays, we powered down our lighting as much as possible, which uh, may enable us to see a lot better at night, as a matter of fact. And uh, basically, we unpowered anything we weren't using at the time we were using it. So it was a little bit of an inconvenience, but not a real uh, impact to our work. If I may now, gentlemen, let me introduce Bryant Gumbel in New York. Bryant? <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Colonel Buck. Good morning. If I might, Colonel Buckley, I, I know you have focused some of your attention on evidence of the Earth's pollution, I'm, I'm wondering what you can exactly see from above. Well, obviously, from this perspective, the scale and scope of any type of, uh, of airborne aerosols is much more dramatic. And what we're trying to do is gather uh, some evidence and documentation uh, to bring back and show people just how much uh, we are dumping into the atmosphere and perhaps get a feel for how that might affect us in future generations. So you can see very, very well from here. Colonel Buckley, since this is your third flight, is it old hat yet? It's never old hat. <laughs> Let me turn to Colonel Springer, if I might. Uh, Colonel, is it difficult to be up there and for all your importance and all the attention you're getting not feel terribly insignificant? Good question. Uh, I don't know that we feel uh, all that uh, terribly uh, important. Uh, I realize that we get a lot of attention because of the work that we're doing, and I think it's uh, rightfully so. The effort that we're doing, some of the projects we're working on, some of the scientific uh, experiments that we're working on are the things that are important and should be getting the attention. But uh, you're certainly right from this perspective up here. Uh, as you look back at the Earth, you certainly feel very, very insignificant. Well, I understand that among the experience, Colonel Springer, that are on board is one centered around crystal growth. Why is that one particularly viewed with such importance? Can you explain it in layman's terms? Well, I think so. The, uh, the, I think the best way to look at it is that we've been trying to develop the protein crystals, which are used in pharmacology and a, a wide variety of drugs uh, for many, many years. One of the limitations that we've experienced is our ability to grow crystals that are uh, large enough and uh, have a good enough structure to be able to examine them. If you were to look at what we've done up to this point in time on Earth, it would you could look at it as having a veil across the work that you're trying to do. By being able to grow larger, more perfect crystals in the microenvironment of space, we're drawing aside that veil and getting a much clearer look at the uh, microstructure and the morphology of the crystals, and hopefully we'll develop some real significant breakthroughs in the uh, pharmaceutical field. Mm -hmm. Let me take a moment here to bring the Air Force into this. Colonel Blaha, you've, you've spent some of your time up there working the IMAX camera. What kind of early problems did you have with it? Well, we really had no problems with it. At uh, one point, uh, we had a small uh, in the camera, but we fixed that very easily, and uh, so no problems at all working with the camera. Uh, we've tried to track some particular targets on the Earth in a qualm and uh, make sure we get some good scenes for the people in Canada that are producing the movie they're trying to produce. Colonel Blaha, I'm going to ask you to wax poetic for us, if you might, for a moment, uh, because you waited nine years for this opportunity in the space program. From liftoff to the moment, is it all you thought it would be? Uh, it's all I thought it would be, and I must say... Uh, the ascent was different than I thought it would be. Uh, uh, very uh, dramatic and uh, quite an acceleration and probably the best ride I've ever had in my life, the first eight and a half minutes. 
Have there been any major surprises? Anything you did not expect? No, no uh, surprises at all. In fact, uh, to tell you the truth, up here in zero G, there's a lot of things that are a lot easier to do than uh, on Earth, and it's quite a quite a neat place to be. It's a shame we can't be here uh, all the time with a permanent manned space station. We ought to get in that direction. What kinds of things? I mean, is there anything you can tell us about? Surely, uh, you can do all the kinds of experiments that we're doing on this flight on a full-time, year-round basis, and. Uh, as a result, uh, just bring along the new things that we could discover from the uh, whole space environment. Let's uh, try to let the civilian in on this. Doc Dr. Bossy and I haven't meant to ignore you all this time, just trying to work our way back there. I know you had hope to research space sickness while up there. What have you learned firsthand? Well, Brian, what we've been doing is trying to collect some uh, data in a new area that technology has just made available to us in recent time, and that's... Uh, study actual blood flow in the main, non-invasively, which uh, is the main thing with the crew, non-invasively. Nobody wants to have a hole drilled in their skull to measure pressure in there. Anyway, uh, we hope by understanding that maybe we'll have a better handle on what causes some uh, space adaptation syndrome, but until we analyze all the data after the flight, it, it takes a fairly sophisticated numerical analysis. Uh, we can't make any conclusions this early. Can we assume that none of the five of you have had any serious problems there? No, everybody just moved right along. Uh, I don't think anybody had any real problems at all. We had, uh, we're just too busy working, I think, to do anything else. There's no chance to slow down. Dr. Bosian, you're set to go up again in 15 months. What are you, what are you hoping to do that time around that you didn't get a chance to this time? Well, I think uh, the one thing all of us are impressed with is that the time goes by extremely quickly. It's hard to believe that uh, it was five days ago that we. Uh, we launched. There's so many things yet we'd like to do, but from an experiment standpoint as well as just on a personal note, having the opportunity to just look at the Earth. Uh, in the case of some of us, a lot of the work we do is on the mid-deck, so we don't get to look outside as much, and you lose a little bit of the perspective of what the Earth looks like and some of the things that Jim uh, Buckley alluded to earlier. Uh, I think none of us could get too much of that time, and each mission would provide some more, so it's just a chance to do more work. and. Uh, and enjoy the sights. I'm not ashamed to admit that. Let me go back to Commander Coates for one final note before I, I give you all back to, to Dan Molina. Uh, Commander, you've flown this shuttle before. Do you look to tomorrow's landing as, as a rather routine procedure? Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, from what everybody has said, the uh, training we get in the shuttle training airplanes is uh, so realistic that uh, once we get below about 50,000 feet in the orbiter, it's uh, like you've been there several hundred times before, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Before I give you back to, to Dan, I'm, I'm aware that you asked about the Siena and Stanford score earlier. Are there any scores I can catch you up on? Uh, we had to give uh, David Lohr, at Capcom, a bad time about the Stanford uh, score since he went to Stanford, and uh, I think that hurt a lot to bring that out. Yeah, Stanford, Stanford did not make it. You'll be surprised to know that Oklahoma only made it by a basket. Let's go back to Dan Molina. Dan? Thank you, Bryant. Uh, Commander Coates, looking ahead to tomorrow, I know you were anxious to get a crosswind landing. How does it look for that tomorrow? Well, we asked this morning uh, when they had the entry team uh, in the control center what the weather was looking like, and uh, it sounds like we have some winds down there. Uh, it looks like there's a possibility of getting the cross landing in. Of course, uh, I think in 20, 27 previous flights, we've had uh, one landing that uh, had a, any kind of a crosswind at all. It's unusual to have it that early in the morning, but uh, it looks like we may get the opportunity tomorrow. Well, to all of you, thanks very much for taking the time to be with us. We all wish you continued success on this flight and a safe and happy landing tomorrow, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay, Dan. Discovery Houston, thanks guys, you did a great job. It's nice looking at you and uh, we're complete with the TV now. Okay. And Discovery, if you have no objection, we'll take the outside TVs. Okay, you've got it, Houston.
Thanks. And Discovery Houston. Go ahead. You have a go for the APU cool off for the flight plan. Roger that. Discovery Houston. Go ahead. We see 
see you maneuvering to the minus ZLV. Just a heads up, we're going to delay the start of the shared day five test. That's the 62 Bravo message because the temperatures have not quite reached equilibrium. You can continue the maneuver and we'll give you a call when we're ready to start the test. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, set up the uh, VDAP and everything and uh, just be ready whenever you're ready. Okay, great.
Discovery Houston for Mike. Go ahead. Mike, after reviewing the uh, COAS data you got for us on the sun a little bit, just a heads up, we're considering asking you to uh, go to the CAL mode after you've shot both the moon and the star uh, in the sight mode on this test and having you repeat a COAS CAL on Danella. We'd like that to be on our call, giving us enough time to take a look at the torquing angles that we see when you do the sight mode marks on the nebula. But just wanted to give you that as a heads up. Okay, uh, we'll uh, wait for your call. We'll do a COAS call on the nebula if you'd like. Okay, thank you.
ahead, here's the discovery. Go ahead, discovery. You can see we're maneuvering to uh, the nebula now. Uh, marking on the moon is like hitting a moving target, as you would expect. And it'd be interesting to see what the accuracy is. Okay, Mike, we copy. As a heads up for you, uh, we do plan to do DTO 790 test three on your next night pass. Uh, and so your step four cleanup in the procedure will not be required until following that test. Uh, Mike, you're correct. Your flight plan update for this morning showed test three, but we want to perform test four as you see in 63 Charlie. Okay, it's, uh, we'll do test case four after this and uh, get Vega and uh, the sun again. Roger. And it's too bad you're busy, Mike. We're having a really good view of you're going through the sunset. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, uh, let me make sure I understand. After we've done this uh, procedure on the nebula, do you want to go do a coax cow again on the nebula? Uh, that's what we're considering, Mike, but going over to cow mode will be on our call. Okay, I understand.
a lot, doesn't it? This is Mission Control. These are live uh, Earth views uh, from the payload bay cameras on Discovery on orbit 67 as it crosses the uh, Pacific Ocean. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, we're trying to uh, plan out uh, our night here. What uh, what time is wake up time tomorrow for us now? Since we're landing early. Stand by one, I'll verify. Yeah, 